Okay, so up next we have this very action-packed set of lightning talks again. Each one's 15 minutes, including uh, time for questions. So it's really up to the speakers to determine how many questions they'd like to get. Um, first speaker up here is going to be Eduardo Bravo from Google, talking about building scalable mobile test infrastructure for Google Plus Mobile. And so you're starting to see a bit more on the application side. So with that, Eduardo. Thank you. It's the green. Can I just push this? There you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Eduardo. I work at Google. And as you guys probably figured out already, I happen to work to, for the Google Plus mobile app. And today I want to talk to you about what we've been doing for the last year and a half. Um, I want to tell you about the test infrastructure we have set up in place for the Google Plus mobile apps. And I want to share you the experience and the problems we have faced when we're doing this. I know mobile testing is still very painful. I mean, we saw the uh, matrix, the test matrix, right? We know how painful this is. But I think after a year and a half, we're in a point where we're comfortable with what we have. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of things to do. There are still things we haven't figured out. But we're in a good state compared to one, uh, one year ago. So but first, first things first. What was our motivation to heavily invest in mobile test infrastructure? Well, you know, G+, we were late into the game. We need to catch up, right? We need a very aggressive development schedule. We know manual testing won't scale to the demands of the fast-paced development we have and of our release process. So it was a no-brainer. We need to do this. We strongly believe in preventing bugs rather than finding. We are obsessive about our pre-commit. We try to, to pack as more, most tests as possible we can. We cannot do all of our tests because we have some very slow tests. But as much as possible, we try to, clean, uh, to keep our build clean, make sure we don't introduce unwanted bugs. So we really take pre-commit seriously. And finally, which is my favorite point, uh, which is flaky test. Uh, the team feels very strongly about this. Flaky tests are worse than having no test at all. And let me explain why. You see, we have Joe. It's 5 PM. He's a little bit bored. He already finished the work he had to do that day. And he's like, well, I don't have enough time to write a new feature. But uh, maybe I would write a test. Why not, right? Let's give it a shot. So he goes there, jumps into Android, writes his test, submits it, passes pre-commit. He's very happy, right? It's a good day of work. You write a killer feature, and you write a killer test. 10 minutes later, we get the email, hey, the test is failing. And he looks at his devs, right? And he's like, oh, look at that. I just find the first bug with my test. I should be very good at this. As he's trying to figure out what's going on and where is the failure, he realizes that the build turns green. So the test is flake. This happens three or four times. And after a while, nobody cares anymore. The build halt is polluted. Whenever there is a failure, most likely people will think it's one of the flaky tests. So that's why the Google Plus Mobile, we strongly believe if we're flake, we rather have no tests than flaky tests. And to make this, we believe in having a hermetic environment. If we cannot provide an hermetic environment for our tests, we rather not write them. So, what do we need to test? We need to test Android. We need to test iOS. And of course, we need to, talk, we need to test the Google backend server. Um, the Android app and the iOS app have a similar release cycle. So in that sense, it's not too bad. The Google backend, it's a different story. It's more aggressive, very fast. But still, we need to make everything play nicely. So let's take a look at how our test infrastructure looks like. For Android. Um, we care about faster unit tests. Um, we use RoboElectric. You guys heard about it uh, yesterday. And just to give you a quick refresher, it allows us to decouple the dependency that the unit tests have on the Android emulator. This, for the Google Plus app, is critical. The Google Plus is huge. So compiling itself is an expensive operation. Then we need to pro-guard it to make sure we don't pass the Dalbic limits that some AP levels have. And finally, we need to install it, which takes around 20 seconds. So all this adds up. 
Luckily, RoboElectric comes to rescue. And we, we can avoid all that. We can compile fast and run the test even faster. Faster development, happier devs, happier devs, more likely to write tests. Then our second strategy for testing in Android is our UI hermetic test. We use Robotium, or let me rephrase that, Gobotium, which you guys can figure out where the name came from, and which is basically our implementation based on Robotium uh, for the UI test framework. We're considering of moving to Espresso, which you guys are going to hear later about it. And let me show you how this UI stack looks. So if you can see the normal flow, that's how it looks. The no that's how a normal test will look. We have, a, we run all our tests, UI tests on emulators. We install the APK, we trigger our test, we connect to the backend, and there is a login server, right? What's the problem in there? Is all those dependencies that we have on external services. The more dependencies we have, the flake our tests are going to be. And we don't want that. It's very hard to work with flaky tests. Hence, what we do is we start in memory Google Plus fake backend server inside the Android emulator. We point the app against it. In fact, the app never knows it's talking to a fake. And this fake server is able to provide pre-canned data. We can control this data. Therefore, our tests are deterministic. And we have caught all the dependencies we have on external services, which don't really matter for the UI part of testing, as well as we don't have to deal with the authentication problems that we will have with the whole flow. Finally, our third strategy is use monkey tests. If you guys are not familiar with monkey tests, uh, they come with the uh, Android SDK. They are very easy to set up. They are very effective. These are the only tests we run on real devices. They catch a lot of bugs. And if you guys are not running this test, you should really consider doing it. They are the best bank for the buck. Now, how do we do it on iOS? Well, for our unit tests, um, we use a unit test uh, case suite based on GTM Sense test case. This comes bund uh, bundled with the Google Toolbox for Mac. So any one of you guys can use it. It has worked very well for us. And for our Metic UI test, we use KIF. We used to use UI Automator, but it didn't. It was flaky. It felt unnatural for our devs. So we decided to move to KIF, which is developed by Square. So kudos to Square team for doing this. Um, it has proved way more stable than our UI Automator test. And also, the way it works in process makes our test less flaky. And on top of that, as I said, we care about hermetic, hermetism. The way we do it here, which is a little bit different from the Android world, is instead of having to start a fake server, what we do is we use Swizzly, a feature. And what it lets us do is, at runtime, we can be able to feed pre responses to the iOS app. That way, we can control the set of data we're feeding to each test, to each run, and everything is hermetic. There are no external dependencies outside of the uh, iPhone simulator. This has proved very effective. The devs actually really like this approach. And it has been much more stable than our old UI automator setup. Now, my favorite part. We have to test the mobile clients, right? But we also need to test the backend. They all have different release cycles. And we want to make sure that, yes, mobile apps don't break, but also that the backend don't break mobile apps. So we have two test strategies here. First, we have end-to-end -end testing on Android, where we start an emulator. We start the Google Plus app. And we start the whole stack of Google Plus backend servers. We provide fake data, because we want the data to be deterministic. Each test gets the same data. And our tests exercise the whole server stack. The tests we have here, uh, is just, there are just a few, a handful of them. Uh, as much as we would like to have more, these tests seem, tend to take longer. So they are harder to enforce in a pre-commit. But still, they are good to have. You, you really want to have some true end-to-end -end tests just to make sure nothing goes terribly wrong when the backend server pushes. And the second ones, which are my favorite ones, which are the replay tests, which are very, very simple. Well, they have proved to be very, very effective. How they work 
is they simulate mobile client's request to the server. And when the clients expect this certain, a golden response back. So let me show you with the diagram. So if you remember from previous um, slides, that's a normal flow. And with the replay test, what we do is we chop away the Android layer. We have a set of golden requests that we know our clients generate, our mobile clients generate. We start our backend server, again, providing fake data. And as we're sending re uh, requests, we're asserting uh, we're sure that the response corresponds to the golden response. If, if it corresponds to it, this means that the server won't break the mobile clients. Because we know that when we tested that, that response makes the mobile clients work correct. We have some smart diffing, because there are things that changes with requests, like timestamps and things like that. So we make sure that doesn't cause flakiness. But uh, this setup has been very, very good to the uh, Google Plus app. In fact, we have this is the one that has got the much, the much box. And yes, we have all these tests running at every commit. I'm sorry for the image. I was, I hope I was, I could find a better one. I'm not really good at it. Obviously, the Barack Obama one was much better than mine, but <laughs> I'm not very good at this type of things. So what I'm trying to say is we have three test strategies on Android. We have two for iOS, and we have two for our backends. And we guarantee that those tests are run at every commit. Most of them are also run on pre-commits, which is what we really care about, too. And finally, I want to share about some of the lessons we have learned during this process. First, since the beginning, care about making the mobile infrastructure scalable and easy to use. Don't give devs a reason not to write tests. The easier it is to write tests, where you provide the right environment, you will be more likely to write more tests. Second, mobile te testing needs to prevent bugs, not affect productivity. If you are spending too much time fixing a test, that affects productivity. There is something wrong somewhere, either on the test, either on the environment. You don't want to stop development. Um, reuse frameworks whenever possible. Uh, yes, we're Google, and we like to do things our own way sometimes. But there are times also that it's also good to reuse. And some of the frameworks are mentioned, like RoboElectric, uh, Kif, uh, Google Toolbox for Mac, are all available. Well, everyone can use them. They work very well for us. And whenever you can, reuse. And finally, let me reiterate on this. Uh, keep test hermetic. Make sure you provide the right environment so people don't have to be worried about it. And if you cannot provide it, don't write the test. It's not worth it. It's going to be more painful later. Thank you. Yeah, nice job, Eduardo. Very nice. Thank you. It always reminds me of how we build software at Google. We have what's working, but it's deprecated and what's new but not yet working. So <laughs> <laughs> he found a nice happy medium by, by finding something that works. So um, with that, we have time for one quick question. So um, we'll go off to the right here. Uh, uh, are, are the end-to-end -end tests flaky? And if not, how do you keep them from being flaky? We tried. The end-to-end -end tests are not flaky. UI tests, we're still dealing with it. We think Express is going to be the solution for it. For the end-to-end -end testing, like the replay test that I show you, the stats we get of flakiness is 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2, which is really, really good for a type of test that it's exercising almost a full Google Plus stack. Yeah, 99% plus pass rate is pretty, yeah. pretty phenomenal. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Thanks. Thank you.